We're back. We're back. How was your vacation? Oh, it was great. I went to Hawaii. I was on the beach the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> it's huh? growing season. So, hey, everyone. <laughs> I'm John Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog's Lead. I'm Rory Williams, uh, chief uh, idiot son. And of bottle the washer. Yeah, yeah, bottle yeah. washer, yeah. forklift. You're finally getting this right. breaker. Hey, I got some breaking news that they have. Apparently, the haircutting salons are opening back up now. Oh, yeah. no. Don't need it. Yeah. yeah. Oh that, my God. That's the only reason people tune in these days. It's uh, just to see how long the hair's gone. You know, it's been, uh, you know, it's, uh, sorry we missed you guys last week. We really did need a week off. Uh, and, uh, it was great. It's a busy time here at the winery, but uh, we're glad to be back. And uh, for a uh, uh, session, is this session 11? This is session 11. Session 11. That's hard to say, you know. It's yeah. not that hard to say. It's a little hard to say, but I've been drinking. Uh, anyway, we're Speaking excited. <laughs> we're excited today because it's Cabernet Day, and with two of my absolute favorite vintages over the last few years, uh, we're going to enjoy and yeah. uh, have some fun talking about Cabernet from Budding to Bottle. Bud, Bud to Bottle is, a, is the title of the session, and uh, as you'll see, we're going we're gonna to have some fun. We actually collected a bunch of photos and some uh, a couple of videos, actually, just to take you through a lot of the steps that uh, that makes Cabernet come to be. And you'll notice uh, as we flip through them that it's, there's going to be a lot more focus on the bud than on the kind of bottle portion of it. So, uh, you know, a, a core belief that we have here at Frog's Leap is that, you know, great Cabernet, um, and you'll hear this trope repeated all over the wine world every day, is great wine is made in the vineyard. Uh, you know, we, I guess, believe in that. Every, every winemaker says that. Very few actually believe that they very believe it. Very few actually believe it. We're going to try and take you through some of the steps that, uh, that try and show you what, what the heck that means. Um, what does it mean to grow great Cabernet? Um, and uh, to do that, Dad, I'm going to need to uh, yeah, there is that. a little something. Now, do we have any technical details that we have to? Uh, yeah, to so we are, uh, for those of you joining us on Zoom, as usual, please ask questions in the Q&A. Uh, you can find information about these wines and past wines, past sessions, and future sessions at interactive.frogsleep.com. Oh my them. God. That was good. Oh, nice to see you. Oh, would you like some? Oh, <laughs> we got one week off and you lost all your manners. You lost all my manners. Ridiculous. <laughs> we got the big boy glasses today, too. That's, that's <laughs> nice. Jessica's taking care of us here. So um, if you have it in front of you, please pour yourself a glass of the 08 Rutherford. 08 Rutherford. Bird. Yeah, which yeah. is pretty cool. This is a, uh, we'll talk just a little bit about the wine and we'll, uh, before we dive into some of these photos, but 2008, yeah. uh, really good vintage, kind of a short crop year. This wine is actually 99% Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, and a shout out because it's 99% Cabernet, mostly are all from the Chavez Leeds vineyard. From so, the Chavez Leeds Yeah, here's to the Leeds family. I think some of them are probably already drinking if I hold the Leeds pretty well. And uh, so we're getting a lot of leads in this class here. It yeah. is, yeah. So the Chavez Leeds Vineyard, uh, farmed by the Leeds family, Frank Leeds and Laura Pesh, um, all the way back into the 80s. A long standing relationship with Frogsley and uh, the original source of, uh, you know, a lot of the grapes that went well, into Well, and, and I think our, our first slide is going to be one that's really, really fun because uh, we should call that up because uh, we actually have a picture of this vineyard being planted. Uh, the grapes that are in this wine. So that is pretty, uh, pretty darn cool. Do you want to start off? Yeah, let's start off. I'm looking to throw yeah. that photo and, yeah. uh, and we'll, we'll kind of show you what, uh, what, what's going on here. Oh my God. Is that Allie? That's Allie Leeds. And Gabby. And Gabby. <laughs> so Allie Leeds, Frank's uh, younger daughter. This is back in 1989. Um, and, you know, it sounds maybe a little bit silly, but uh, how do you, how do you get a great Cabernet Sauvignon vine? Well, you got to plant it. You start with a hole in the ground. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is what we call the white hall block at Leeds. Um, and this is way back in the day. Gabby, uh, who's you see there right next to the stake, uh, one of my mentors in the vineyard, still working for Frog Sleep, uh, our chief mechanic, one of our top tractor guys, and, uh, and a good friend. Yeah. I've been, been able to spend a couple of uh, winters down in uh, down in uh, his family home in Oaxaca and been able to share times with him. but. You know that a lot of this goes back to, to the very beginning where planting a grapevine in the in the correct well that you, you know something about planting a grapevine in the correct direction at least <laughs> come on you gotta tell that story i can't remember that story you're gonna have to tell it uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my dad is one of his first jobs here in the, in the valley is working for spring mountain vineyards oh wow uh, that story yeah yeah <laughs> and uh he got instructed to plant a vineyard up on uh, 
for Spring Mountain and was instructed to, uh, to plant the, the well, roots I, in the I, wrong direction. I, I, that's a, the, 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 the story is, I, I, I wasn't actually involved in the planting, but the vineyard crew who actually knows how to plant a grapevine, the owner came in and was so convinced that the bushy end was the, the, the part that was supposed to go up in the air, right? Because that was going to become the branches of the roots insisted that all the guys plant the roots upside down in the vineyard and right. of course they all died so yeah. <laughs> had to replant it so, so there's a lot to planting a vineyard is what you're saying it, it, and it starts long before you actually put the roots in the ground exactly so you can you can see the prepared field here and when we go into some of the other photos later on you'll see some of the cover crop uh, that goes into preparing a field in the right way um, but you know yeah planting a, a, a root in the right direction uh, obviously very important but one thing we do here, uh, uh, we got to stop for just a minute. I need everyone to put your nose in this glass. Yeah. My goodness, you know, we talk about Rutherford and Rutherford dust. You don't have to ever describe it. You just need to smell this glass. This is what it's all about. This is really exceptional. You know, I, I, we have to all remember to take that. If you want to learn how to appreciate wine, just take that moment when you get this wine in, in and just take a moment to put that memory back into the real recesses because every time you smell a wine that's got this level of rough or dust, it is, it's like one of those outer body experiences. Yeah. And this is a really cool wine here. And yeah. you know, we, we love starting with the 08 just on, on this because it really does dive, make you dive right into why, why Cabernet? Why, why, why make Cabernet? Why, why grow Cabernet in Rutherford? This has kind of reached that proper age where it's really starting to settle into those really extremely complex aromas it's giving you that dust giving you the floral giving you that kind of dried herb character the cedar so and graphite we, let's take one step back even further how do you know a site is good for cabernet sauvignon yeah. because not all sites just because it's the napa valley doesn't mean that it's everything all soils are good for cabernet sauvignon yeah. here so maybe you could give a little description about what it means to be good but not too good I think exactly really yeah pleasant. So it's, you know, the, the phrase good but not too good is, is the term we apply to, to great Cabernet soils. And what that really means is that you're talking about a site that has good drainage, which means that water, you know, all the rainfall that we get in the winter, it's going to penetrate deep down into the soil. It's not going to cool up on top. That's the characteristic of like a wetland soil, very uh, soil, very heavy in clay um, and very, uh, you know, where the water is not going to penetrate as quickly and it's not going to trickle down into the depths of the soil very quickly. Um, typical Cabernet soils have a lot of sand and a lot of especially gravel in them. The, the kind of classic soils, uh, Rutherford, and Oakville, and Mid Valley, uh, Napa Valley, are these gravelly loams where you have loam just means kind of a nice balance between sand and clay and silt, and that gravel is in there to kind of help separate these little portions of loam, and that's what allows the, the, the soil to absorb water and the loam allows it to, re to retain some of that water in the soil and the gravel allows a lot of it to drain out. Not to have water. wet feet. Exactly. And so you want those, you know, the, the metaphorical term would be dry feet on, on Cabernet Sauvignon. You don't want it sitting around with lots of water pooling down below. Um, at the, so you want these kind of soils that are limiting enough to, to allow water to, to just pass all the way through. You, what you don't want, though, are the super fertile, super rich, super right. deep soils because that are- the, vine, the more a vine grows like a weed, the more the wine tastes like a weed. So green flavors are associated with being too good or too fertile a soil that allows too much vigorous growth of the it, vine. Exactly. And so, you know, there are soils in Napa, especially chiefly right up against the Napa River, where you'll have bands of soil that are just so rich and so fertile, great for Sauvignon Blanc, uh, great for some other varieties. Uh, great for walnuts and great for, uh, great for wheat, but it's uh, not typically great Cabernet Sauvignon soil. And the, the issue with Napa is that, you know, we say, hey, the soil is close to the river, but it's, uh, you know, the great soil kind of appears like a, like a kaleidoscope all over Napa. It's not just this single band, even Rutherford, which is very famous for its Cabernet Sauvignon. You can't just say, hey, all of Rutherford, it's this band in the middle and all of it's great for Cabernet. Well, some people would. Well, you, you could, but in reality, Napa and, and a lot of great wine districts have these bands of soils that uh, really make it extremely complex. And, you know, if you're really talking about, yeah, the first step in great Cabernet is choose the right ground to plant it. It's Always very, with any wine, right? I mean, you got to have the, the soil and the, and the, and the aspect uh, to set yourself up from success. 
Then you prepare this land, you got to let it rest, you got to build up its biological uh, soil by cover crops, uh, sometimes some mineral additions uh, mm -hmm. to the soil to get it prepared for the vineyard, yeah. getting it nice and loose. And then we're back to this photo of digging a hole virtually really and big. only planting the roots. And can I you think, explain that? I think this is, uh, now maybe we can show the second photo on here, just because one thing that we do at Frog Sleep that's very different than the typical way of doing things is when we go to plant a vineyard of Cabernet Sauvignon, we don't plant Cabernet Sauvignon. We plant rootstock first. And so this kind of gets back to some basic vine, because basic vine structure is that almost all modern grape vines are going to be grafted onto Native American rootstock. And rootstock means the actual roots that are in the soil, in contact with the soil, onto which you graft Cabernet Sauvignon. So that's, those, those are just, back, go back there, one, Natalie, that's, that's just rootstock growing. That's just right? rootstock. So everything you see growing out of the ground there is actually St. George rootstock, which is right. not a wine grape. It's a whole different species that is resistant to the phylloxera root pest. And then that's really key to understand why we use a rootstock is because all Vitus vinifera is very susceptible to a root disease or a root aphid called phylloxera. It's why the vineyards were wiped out in France in the 1800s, why the vineyards were right, wiped out in the, the Napa Valley in the, in the late 1800s, why uh, vineyards were wiped out again in Napa in the 1980s, uh, 1980s. And it's this root disease. And so we need to plant these grapes on a resistant rootstock. All the differ all over the world now is planted for the most part on resistant roots. So this is something you have to do to phylloxera. Here though, we, you know, the way that we manage our rootstock is we take it a step further and really we use that rootstock for our advantage. Um, because, you know, one thing we haven't talked about a lot, Dad, is dry farming. Correct. And this is so, so at the core of our farming belief and our farming practice in terms of what makes great Cabernet. And, you know, dry farming in, in simplest terms is, yeah, not irrigating. We, right. we, we don't irrigate our Cabernet Sauvignon grape vines ever. Um, in a more technical term, it's setting up the vine to thrive with its own root system so it doesn't need to be irrigated. Exactly. So, so dry so farming, happen. sort of for those of you who joined us for the organic farming seminar, um, and we mentioned this about dry farming, where organic farming isn't about not spraying chemicals or not doing this or not doing that. It's all the things you do so that you don't have to spray synthetic chemicals and, and, and spread a bunch of fertilizer all, all over the field. Dry farming is not so it's much about- the corollary to that, but with respect to water. Exactly. Yeah. So, so we are setting up our vineyards so that they never need water to grow. Even in very dry years, like the 14 that we'll taste, even in dry years like this year, the vines do not need any additional water you're looking at dry farming right now in, in this, in in this yeah. photo because we plant rootstock in the spring. So, uh, but we plant it as a bare rootstock. If there's no vine, there's no Cabernet Sauvignon grafted onto, this, onto these vines at that, at that point of planting. We allow the rootstock to grow on its own for an entire year, uh, for an entire growing season. And then we will graft on Cabernet in the fall. And we can take a look at what the graph. I think that's process. actually happened in this photo because I see that you've uh, cut some of the yeah, line wrong. Exactly. That, no, yeah. that's, that's actually just post graphic but all yeah, you yeah. can see is, is St. George on there. But if we flip to the next photo, we can see actual grafting in action. So what uh, the butter uh, has in his hands right there is a St. George rootstock, and he's taking a budding knife and starting to cut a notch in the rootstock. Um, and for those of you actually interested on our YouTube channel, we, uh, I've got a couple of videos on, on, a, uh, on oh, grafting actually, yeah, and, yeah. and seeing yeah, this in action as a video. Um, and we'll flip through some of these photos, but you know, this is the process of putting Cabernet Sauvignon into, into action. So this is happening in the fall. Um, and we yeah. can- Now, yeah. just to back up a little bit to understand why we did that is that when the, when the rootstock can just grow and support itself, it's putting, it's, it's putting a much deeper root system down into the ground. If it had been grafted uh, and only had the one thing going up, it wouldn't have as much leaf area, it wouldn't develop as much rooting. Uh, so we've given it this chance to build this um, a deep rooting system really early in the game. Yeah. And, and I think we'll see later that we have to support that at least once and sometimes twice yeah. in that summer with a little bit of water, you, but then it's pretty much on its own after. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, allowing that rootstock to grow on its own without being encumbered or having the res really the responsibility of growing Cabernet Sauvignon, of supporting a Cabernet Sauvignon bearing vine on top, 
allowing it to grow on its own for a whole year, sends those roots down deep. And St. George, which is the root stock that we typically use for most of our Cabernet vineyards, not all, but, but most of them, is a very deep rooting root stock. And so it will send its, its evolve to want to send its roots very deep down into the soil very quickly. And that's an advantage for us because that means that after an entire growing season of that vine sending its roots down deep, it's an incredibly strong vine at the point that we finally graft Cabernet Sauvignon onto it. Now, this isn't the quickest way to get a Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, it's actually one of the slowest <laughs> ways to get a Cabernet Sauvignon. But, but it you, is the correct way from the very beginning. You have to start. And, and you know, I love to quote the, quote the Tao, right? And the Tao says, what is rooted is easy to nourish. So setting up a, a vineyard with a deep rooting system already just makes it so much easier uh, going forward for the health of that. It, it really sets you're setting up the vine for success and dry farming you know it's again we will come back to this over and over again it's it's really not about just turning off the water in right. fact the, these vines are, are are not set up with irrigation systems none of our vineyards are and it's you know these vines are not prepared to receive irrigation water because they've been so conditioned to just not expect it um, these vines have grown on their own without having lots of additional waterings. They're not expecting summer rainfall, which we don't get, which, you know, that, you know, so why does that matter? You know, why, why would dry farming matter to a grapevine? You know, it's, if, if the point is, and, you know, we, we've talked about this a couple of times, is why make wine? You know, why, why make Cabernet Sauvignon uh, in Napa, of all things? Yeah, it tastes good, but, you know, you, you said it best when you, you stuck your nose in the glass. You said it tastes like Rutherford. For the wine to taste like Rutherford, it's got to grow like it does in Rutherford. In Rutherford, we don't get summer rain. Vines that receive extra water during the summer are being tricked into thinking that they're growing that growing somewhere else. And if, if a wine is going to taste like the place that it's made, it needs to reflect the soil, the sun, and the water, and the nutrients, you know, it's microflora in that soil. Absolutely, every molecule in this in this glass came from that soil, from that air, from that water, right? or nothing exactly. came from anywhere else. You know, and I think we'll talk about, we talk about balance and restraint, respect for terroir. That's what we're talking about here, this unique character that comes from being deeply connected. You know, we talk about this dry farming like it's some radical concept, but when I got here in 1975, there were no irrigated vines in the Napa Valley. Everything was dry farmed. And so, just so you know, uh, irrigation of grapevines is not allowed in many of the other grapevine growing regions of the, Europe, of the world. So you think of France and Italy and Spain and Portugal and uh, Germany, they're not allowed to irrigate grapes because they know that it overproduces uh, mediocre wines. And, and really, to make great wine, uh, irrigation should not be employed. We just believe that fundamentally and we don't believe, uh, uh, and now unfortunately, I think well over 95% of the vineyards in Napa are, are irrigated. And we think that that's led to a style that we are not we don't necessarily agree with. Yeah. But moving on, we saw this butt going in. I want to we see We saw the butt going in. Let's bring that photo back up. Uh, if you can, Natalie, and kind of uh, flip through some of the next photos, which show the process in action. So that's the cutting in there. What yes, you see, the that, in, what right you see in between the, the thumb and the forefinger that's going into that notch is the Cabernet Sauvignon bud. Um, and so this is going down. You can see the bud there that's been cut off of uh, some wood selected from a, a, an existing block of Cabernet, and it's being inserted into the rootstock there, and that's where it all comes from, folks. Um, it's, who, do you, who, who do you think's doing that budding right there? This is Freddie. So Freddie is, is our that, top, the top Freddy? butter on our crew. You can see the bud now. You should tell him he's got his fingernails so extruded. <laughs> it's uh, so you can see the the bud notched in there. In the next photo, he'll start to secure that bud into place okay. by wrapping some uh, tape around that bud. This is happening in the Can fall. Can we zoom in on that? Um, so this is happening, typically this is gonna be happening in the fall. Oh yeah, fall. see the little rubber band there, right? Exactly. That's holding that bud into, into the graft. So this is uh, holding that bud into the graft union. And then what we'll do is tape that all around, get it nice and secure. And then this will actually be covered right back up right. with dirt and it'll be piled and left alone for an entire winter. Now the, the rest of the vine is still growing, the rest of the, 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 the Rootstock is growing up above. It doesn't know it's going to, what happened to me there. And right? actually, usually you want it to keep growing because you want that rootstock to up. to send sap upwards towards the bud to help heal, heal that graft union. Okay. Um, and that's what the winter is for. The the, the 
spine is going to continue to grow and heal that wound. You know, this, this the, today's session from uh, Cabernet Bud the bottle, and we're hardly going to get off Bud. You yeah, know? That's, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> by the way, it's going to be a series. Did you really go? And you know, you by, the, by the next spring, if we flip to the next photo, um, you I should. I'm most sense on top of my mouth. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, we'll let this uh, bud hang out over the spring, uh, over, over the winter, it'll heal. And then by the time we go to uncover that vine in the spring, um, that bud will have healed into the rootstock and really become one with the vascular system of the rootstock. And that's really what you're doing when you're grafting is matching up the vascular system, the, the way that the sap and nutrients flow and out of that oh, comes... cut off her head. <laughs> so at this point, this is the next spring. This is what it's going to look like. So we'll have come in here. We'll have taken off. You can see the little the remnants of the tape that held that bud into place. It's all healed in now. That's all healed in. And it, we've checked this bud and made sure that everything is coming out. So we, that's the little bit of the Cabernet Sauvignon just getting started. So I, I, I absolutely love this photo because so at this point we cut off the head of the St. George. So that St. George is not going to have any more uh, foliage on top. But out of that little bud comes the entire structure of the Cabernet Sauvignon. And came this one. And came that one. This is, this is how Cabernet grows. It's, it's really quite incredible because within a few short years, that'll be a fully fledged vine with multiple canes, multiple spurs. Fast forward. A big, a big <laughs> fat trunk. Um, it is pretty incredible to uh, imagine. And, and really what you're looking at here is you're looking at a rootstock that's had time to develop. It's had an entire year to grow its root system. There's a cool question about how, you know, how many feet deep are the roots. Uh, at this point, if you stick your hand on that rootstock and try to pull it out, you wouldn't be able to do it. It has um, grown that much. It's grown down so, uh, at least a couple of feet into the soil with several different root strands going all over. It's deeply connected to that soil and it's sending all of its energy upwards into the Cabernet Sauvignon bud. And that's what allows it to grow so quickly. It's, it's you know, got all this well, this wellspring of energy that, has, that, you know, that we've designed to, to allow to go into this bud. There, is an, there are other ways of planting grapevines. You can buy them as uh, previously grafted in a nursery, and then you just kind of stick them in the ground. And at that point, because the roots aren't very strong, you have to babysit them. You have to add a bunch of water and, and fertilizer to that, uh, to that root to, just to keep it alive. And they'll never really grow a, a deep enough root system. I would take a lot at that point. It's thus you need the irrigation you need. But it's not only the water the vine is getting, it's getting the nutrients it needs too. So a fertility needs to be added. So this is what happens if you don't have a good root system, you don't, can't get enough water, you can't get enough fertility. So then the farmer has to add the water to fertility. And the way they do is they put fertilizer actually right in the irrigation water and drip it to the base of the plant. And this is how way too many grapevines are grown. And so I uh, just want a little bit different. Uh, yeah, it's, it's easier in a way. I want to see what's next. What do you, are you, <laughs> these are great pictures. You know? No, yeah. thank you. Oh, so, you know, uh, we, we talked a little bit about like grapes. Yeah, these are grapes, <laughs> but this is how you get a great, uh, you know, how do you build up the nutrients in that soil? This is how you do it. So this is a, a block of, uh, of vines that have just been grafted, but this is in the spring. Right. So right before we're, we're going through and, and mowing down the cover crop, this is how high the mustard can get. So this is, uh, this yeah. is yellow mustard. And, and many of you remember the organic talk we did and, and we were actually sitting out in the cover crop and how it felt yep. and talking about this being the food for the soil. Well, here you see, see that. Now this is going to get turned back into the soil. Exactly. And this is where the fertility for our vineyard comes from. Exactly. So I think if we go to the next photo, we can uh, start to see some of that managed. So oh, now, here we go. So you've turned all the uh, cover crop into the soil now. Here's the young vine just starting to come up. Yep. So, yeah. you, so you saw in the... Oh, in I recognize the, where that is. Yep. Yeah. This is right at Rossi. This is a new block of Cabernet Sauvignon that we just planted a couple years ago. Um, but right here you see the vines uh, just about a month, month and a half after you, after the photo of that tiny little bud coming out of the... So seeds. all that growth now just came out of that one little bud. Just that one little bud. And so it's now growing out at a pretty rapid rate. These, uh, you know, I'm kind of looking at these like, man, we needed to tie these a little bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was gonna say, so you better get the work Who tied. managed those grapes? Come on. Um, but so these vines are gonna get tied up the stake and they'll soon become- uh, The architecture of the vine. The architecture yeah. of the vine. So yeah. a, lot, a lot of that growth, the, by the time the end of the summer uh, and the fall hits, 
for those, the next slide too, those, guys. I don't want those to green shoots will have uh, will pass uh, the, the wires up on top. It's really a ton of growth going into that vitamin in the first year. And that's really important because you want to have this strong core to, to design the architecture of the vine. And off of that, we're drawing spurs. Um, this is actually, you know, because there was a great uh, uh, question on here, does rootstock initial planting need watering at the start? Right. And it does. And this is how we do it, is we don't install irrigation lines because irrigation lines very specifically add small amounts of water over a long period of time. At the top of the soil profile. At the top of the soil profile. So you can see the tiny bud coming out of that rootstock. We zero in on that. Yeah, yeah. so this, uh, this bud has been grafted on. It's starting to grow out. Um, this is actually, I believe, seven young block coming out of, this, out, of this, uh, out of this plant. We didn't have to fill out one that. Yeah, <laughs> but it's, this is indicative of, and, and something very, very cool because we've gone through and hand dug a hole around this root. So now look, so see what we're trying to do here is not put the water up on the top of the surface. That would encourage the roots to grow up to get the water. What they want to do is dig a hole next to the vine, put the water in so it soaks under the ground and the water's below the root. The root says, oh my God, the water's down there and will start driving its roots down deeper and deeper and deeper. And this is of course setting this uh, vineyard up then to never be, have to be watered again, or maybe once more we'll have yeah, to do this, it. This is the very last watering that this vine will see. Um, and it's kind of incredible. So the, the, typically the rootstock we watered once or twice just as pure rootstock right, right after we planted in its first summer. Right. Um, to, uh, and in this manner to send the water down deep and that's why deep, uh, well-drained soils are important. So they right. just pool on top. Um, it'll send that, that, uh, that water down in kind of an inverted pyramid style. The roots will chase after that water as it goes down into right. the soil profile, sending the roots down deep We've grafted the vine on, we've cut the head, we've, al we've allowed the vine to start growing. And then before it bears any fruit, this vine has received its last watering. And because the rootstock has been allowed to grow deeply and really establish itself in the soil, it, it's not that we cut it off from watering and say, hey, good luck. It doesn't need it. It's that it doesn't need it past this. And it's really incredible to see a vine this young um, just not need water, even in dry years. Um, and really all of that is about setting up the, the soil profile to allow this vine to respond well. So now we're coming up the stake and uh, what, what's next? What happens? Uh, you know, we got to keep moving. Here. Well, then, you get, then you got a vine. Then, you got a vine. then it's the easy part. Okay, you know? so, so here you can see this, yeah. this is after the first year and that you've got this has come up the stake and now you're going to start getting it going out on the trellis. So exactly. Good. So you're seeing uh, on the other side of those stakes, you're seeing the new vines start to start to come out. Um, and you're seeing, uh, if you look at that center, at that center stake, you'll see two little sticks coming out to the left and to the right. Those are the two kind of starter spurs that start the architecture of the vine to spread out in two different directions. Can we go any tighter now? And you'll see the long, the slightly longer cane coming out of that uh, out of that right vine. there, yeah. There you go. So you're starting the architecture of this vine, then, right? Exactly. So that cane is allowing the vine to to kick off a little bit of energy because at this point, remember, you've got such a strong root system that you it actually wants to grow. it wants to grow like crazy. And you, you want it to be able to manage that growth. And so, uh, one of the advantages of the way the way that we prune is that we are able to kind of tailor every the 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 way that we prune at each vine to the strength of that particular vine. Some vines are stronger, some vines are weaker, just depending on- It comes on back to balance. You know, you, you guys, we keep using this word balance, right? And, but the, the balance starts right here because the, the balance of the rooting system to the, to the growth up above has got to be in the right proportion or else you, you get out of whack. Mm -hmm. and, and I know a lot of people say, well, how many, uh, what's your tons per acre on your fruit? Well, that will vary depending on the soil and the vine and its architecture and the fertility of the soil and a lot of things. What you want to do is find balance between the yield and the capacity of growth to support that yield. Yeah. And this is how you start that process from the very beginning. Yeah. The, the, the yield of a particular block will vary as much as 50% 50, 50 uh, in between different blocks depending on the soil type there. Right. Um, it's, you know, this is kind of the start of, of the vine and, and this is really where all this starts and we wanted to take some extra time that you know we're already you know nearly halfway through this session and we haven't even talked about grapes at this point but it's so important to, to, next, so to understand next, it's so important to understand where uh you know how the vine is being established because here you have 
um, in this case, actually Cabernet Franc vines, uh, but very typical kind of setup for a young but mature, mature in its form vineyard. Um, and this is at our Rossi, at our Rossi Ranch um, during winter. Uh, so no, no grapes on this one, but you can see the kind of eventual structure of the vine. This is at, right after a uh, the vine been pruned and now untied down onto the stage. Exactly. Yeah. So this is, you know, all of the work that goes into all that came from that little bud. Exactly. So you see the mature vines. These vines are about uh, 15 years old at this point. Um, all of that growth came out of that single bud. So you realize how important is it to, to put the right amount of effort into that single bud, into making that bud strong and making that bud have, have the right kind of root system. Because it, it's, it's so easy to just say, oh, well, the, the most important thing is the fruit, right? Wow. And, and in a sense, yeah, I mean, if you don't have fruit, you don't have, uh, you don't have wine, which is what we're here for afterwards. Yeah. After That's all, what but, I'm for anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I'm here, actually here for a little bit more. Yeah, if you don't if I, no, we, we have to try this. Okay, we'll try to put you slow down a little bit. You know, you got. You got but what, it, what's this now? So okay, here, yeah, here we go. This, the spring is coming. Right? So you know, after all this has been, uh, after you know, after talking about the establishment of the vine and how everything gets started with all this, uh, maybe we we'll talk a little bit about how vines actually grow. Yeah. What do you What do you think? I think, uh, you know, well, let's get to the great part because that's the important part right here. So here's the bud. So this is just starting out uh, the, the next year. Of growth. Yeah. So you can see the little white, uh, the little white kind area of in the center of that. If you touch that with your finger, um, it would feel cottony. And so this is right before the bud. This is on a cane. So that's it's called bud break. Uh, very close. So this is pri prior to bud break. Uh, Pre-bud break. Pre-bud break. So this, <laughs> bud, this bud has not, uh, not come out yet. This is going to be early spring. Right as the vine is kind of sensing the, the temperature in the air, it's sensing the soil temperature and how wet the soil is, it's trying to make the decision, hey, is it time for me to send my, my, my buds out? Because once it makes that decision, it's really committed. Um, and we'll show you why that's so important. Because, you know, if you, you know, this, this is an incredibly important decision for this grapevine. And it's funny, it's really fun to uh, study a little bit about plant physiology because here's this vine, it's right on the precipice of making this decision because once that green growth comes out, it's very susceptible to spring frost. I think we have a picture of spring frost and that will kill it. And so it has to be very careful about going out, but if it waits too long, the other vines will have uh, grown up around it and will gather all the sun and it won't prosper either. So uh, there are actually three mechanisms for a vine to know when to push its bud out. Two of them are in the roots and one of them is an actual bud itself. And these are the hormones that say go. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting to note that all three of them have veto power over the other two. Yeah. And, and so, the, in other words, the roots, the air can be warm up above, and the, vine, the bud is thinking, well, let's go, let's go. But the roots are down there, and the soil is still cold going down that time yet, yeah, right? Time. They have to all agree to make that happen. That was so cool. Yeah. Great minds are pretty smart, aren't they? Yeah, smarter than us. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> but not that that's a very high standard. On the other hand, they're not drinking OA cap. That's true. That's true. <laughs> So if we go to the next photo, you can see, you know, once they, uh, what's yeah. the consequence of making a poor decision. And, and we had plenty of this in the 08 uh, vintage, as I remember, exactly. right? So, so we'll pause here and just talk a little bit about 08. Um, so this is a photo of a frost night, and you can see the frost on the ground. Um, this is uh, actually at Rossi, I believe. This is a pick in the middle of the night, obviously. Frost is one of the primary dangers that you have here in Napa Valley is, is springtime frost. And that can, you know, in bad years, really threaten the life of the buds and yeah. really threaten their, their existence. Uh, 2008, which one of the, the interesting little things about 2008 was a frost year, meaning which we had lots of nights where the temperature got down to freezing or down below, right as the vines were sending out their buds. And that's uh, was probably the last uh, really intense frost year we well, had. Well, do you remember when I got you and Tyler and Kelly up really early, I think it was four o'clock in the morning, you were so happy with me. And I said, <laughs> I, want you, I want you to go see Frost. And we went, we got up and we drove around into all the different vineyards. You could see the smudge spots going, the big fans, and this whole activity was going on. And then of course, by the time the sun comes up, that all stops because the threat of Frost has gone away. We went to breakfast at Sherry's yeah. and, and I think it was Kyder says, how would how would anyone know that even happened last night? And uh, the farmer knows. <laughs> As you can see from the, the super high quality of that photograph, it's hard to take photos in the middle of the night. Um, but I wanted to give a sense of um, 
So in 2008, that, uh, that same situation where you're up at uh, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, making sure the frost fans are working, making sure that uh, your frost protection systems, whether- and, and the frost fans, by the way, these are the big propellers that you see. If you visit Napa Bill, you see look, look, look like big propellers out in the vineyard. All they're trying to do is what happens is the cold air settles, the warm air will be up on top and those fans are there to mix that air up. So the overall temperature will be above freezing and that's what those do. The other way of protecting you is you'll sometimes see in vineyards, including some of our sprinklers. Well, those aren't for watering the vines. They're for spraying water out. And as long as the, the, the cold is trying to freeze that water, it'll never get below 32 degrees. And so that's a different way of frost protecting. In the old days, we used to have smudge pots or burn tires and so on. We don't do that so much anymore, but uh, I think we still have some around, by the way. Uh, yeah, we haven't used them in a, a very, very long time, which is yeah. good. Well, we uh, used them in 08. Yeah. yeah. That's the yeah. last time I think they would, they would have been dragged out. But, you know, frost is one of those invisible things about Napa and, and invisible things about lots of uh, wine areas. You know, sometimes you'll see dramatic photographs from France and they have little, they have different ways of setting out candles every five, every, every five yards yeah. to, to yeah. heat up the air around it. Different areas of the world who deal with frost have to deal with it in different ways. Um, but it is one of, you know, it's a defining feature of 2008. Which, it is because it reduced the crop this year incredibly. Yeah. Right? I mean, and, and that's why it's an interesting vintage case because the, the crop was substantially reduced by, uh, uh, by the frost uh, that happened that spring. Uh, the, yeah, I think we had, it was almost a month straight for frost nights uh, going into it. Yeah. It sounded, uh, I was off. That's where we need Frank. He would know the exact number of days. Well, I guess because he was up doing it. So <laughs> yeah, it's, right. uh, it's uh, and it's, you know, in, in a way it's sort of, uh, Frank, text me the, uh, no, actually, no, 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 no. <laughs> we'll make up. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's one of the defining features of, of 08. And what, part of why it's fun to crack open these old bottles. Okay, is, your bit stem was almost over here. What else you got to show us here? Part yeah. of the reason it's fun to crack open these old bottles is, <laughs> <laughs> when did I, whatever, um, is to, you know, to reminisce, to, to think about, you know, what went into this year. What, 2007, yeah. by contrast, Beautiful, ripe year. Everything was great. You know, just very bountiful, plentiful vintage. Yeah. And then you get paid for that in uh, in March, the next spring of yeah. 08, uh, with frost night, frost after, night. after yeah. frost night, after frost night. And you know, that's what goes into enjoying a bottle of wine. Is thinking about when it was made, uh, how it was made, where the wine came from. Well, that 08 yeah. is beautiful. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad this much of it survived. Frost it because did. it is absolutely a treasure drink. That I'm ready for a little bit of my favorite vintage of the uh, of the, uh, the last decade or so. Are you ready for that? I'm ready for it. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, hmm. yeah. I'll pour you a little more of that. Don't oh. worry. Yeah. All right, here we go. 2014, you guys. I love this vintage. So I think that maybe it's a good time to pause and take a few questions sure. here. Yeah. Um, why start with the 08? Because it's Sean's favorite, or or some other reason. Um, <laughs> You know, just the you know, it's wines are about stories, you know, and, and it's just, uh, it's a fun story. It's, it's cool that it's almost 100% from the Leeds Vineyard, which uh, some and, of you were. And we had a picture with Allie, who's now a beautiful young woman and artist up in Portland. Uh, stuff in Portland, Oregon. And, and uh, uh, it, it's just, it's very cool to think about, uh, you know, where the vines come from, who they, who they come from. Um, and all the hands that go into these over, over yeah, time. So we just really wanted to see you kind of show you the start of that first wine almost. Yeah. Yeah. How many different soil types are found in Apple Valley? Dozens. Um, More than dozens. The, actually, the ge geological uh, survey lists 134 different soil types in Napa. And it's what is so mind boggling about this. And it's why this kind of formula that uh, Napa should only be planted to Cabernet Sauvignon is wrong. Uh, it is not like the Medoc. We do not have. Uh, uh, or, or for that matter, the, 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 the you know, the Cote de Bonne or Cote de Nuit. It's, it's not a single soil type. And that needs to be taken into consideration when you yep. find a vineyard. Absolutely. The 08 is wonderful. We have some crystals on both the 08 and the 14 quartz. Yes. Any thoughts? That's good. Yeah. Uh, those, are, those are diamonds. Uh, you should yeah. keep those. Yeah. And, uh, and so they're worth more than the wine itself. I wasn't yeah. able to convince Tori of that. We tried to put, don't try and put it in a ring down. It's taking the experience. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so the diamonds that you're seeing, those are potassium tartrate crystals. And so these are basically the tartaric acid, which is the primary grape acid. It's what gives wine its acidity. Those will, uh, will actually uh, chelate and, and, 
and form into crystals and fall out of the wine. Yeah. And so yeah, it's the, the wine diamonds. Uh, it's actually the number one reason for people to reject wine in restaurants is because there's glass in my wine. It's <laughs> almost never glass. It's almost always potassium bitartrate crystals. And uh, it's, it, it's indicative of a wine that has not been over processed. Yeah. That's absolutely true. So consider those to be little diamonds uh, showing you the, what a, a great job uh, uh, we did get you, getting you a beautiful and natural wine without too much processing. Yeah. yeah. What type of plant is rootstock if it is not a wine vine? That's a very good question. It's so the wine vine or vitis vinifera, so wine vine, uh, quite literally. Genus species. Genus species. So the wine vine, vitis vinifera, is actually originally from the Caucasus. So it's from modern day Turkey and Iran and Georgia. Uh, not the not the state, the country, and that's where it originated, uh, you know, millennia ago. And it moved from there through the Silk Road, through trading patterns all throughout Europe and Northern Africa. And that's really where wine comes from. It was selected by humans and and really, you know, selectively bred by humans over the millennia to form all the different cultivars that we know today: the Cabernet Sauvignons the Merlots, the Sauvignon Blancs, all of these great varieties of the same species, and they all come from this original, you know, source of grapevines yes, in the But now the roots are a different, uh, same uh, genus, but different species. So uh, Vitus um, um, uh, Rotundifolio, or, or uh, 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 Rupestris, or Berlandieria, or Riparia. Riparia, all Vitus Arizonica. There are, so Vitus just means vine. And that's the genus, um, and the species is either vinifera or all these other names that follow it. Vines are native to all over the world, and so uh, vitis, um, you know, vitis vinifera native to the Caucasus and native native to Iran, but vitis rupestris, which is the species of the Saint George rootstock, is native to North America, and the reason that it was that we select it as um, being resistant to phylloxera is that phylloxera is also endemic in North America. So it, phylloxera and vitis rupestris co-evolved so that they are, even though you actually find phylloxera on rupestris roots, it doesn't, bother. It, doesn't, it doesn't kill the roots because they've evolved to resist the phylloxera pest. Whereas mm -hmm. phylloxera, because it's native to America, native to North America, um, it's not found in Iran, and vitis vinifera never evolved to any kind of resistance to phylloxera, which oh, means goodness, that if sorry. you plant vitis vinifera straight mm -hmm. into the ground, it, it'll grow for a few years, and in most cases in the modern day world, it will die. There are very there are a few ex exceptions. There are own rooted vines in rare spots around California in soils that don't support phylloxera, and there are certain areas of the world like Chile, which never got phylloxera. They were the the vine arrived. Uh, at a late enough time to, for them to be able to prevent the spread of phylloxera. All the spread of phylloxera all over the world happened because cuttings used to just kind of go out and without taken. any kind of control, and that's how phylloxera got spread all around. Like most, like most uh, diseases, uh, yeah. I think that we may have a current example of yeah. humans. So anyway, it, look, we need to take a second with this for yeah. you. Know, so let's, let's take a second with this. Absolutely gorgeous. You know, we, we hear this term Rutherford dust. It's attributed to my mentor, Andre Telestep, this idea that a wine would have this very, very specific yeah, character in place. And uh, Natalie, you're on with us here. Um, yeah, every, if anyone wants to know what Natalie looks like, there she is, our technical director. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wave to the camera, Natalie, say hi. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the scenes look. Behind the scenes look here, you guys. <laughs> Give her a round of applause, folks. Yeah, right. yay. <laughs> Now I'm trying, you just now trying to do that for Jessica. Jessica's saying no. Natalie, you just saw has been organizing all of these, uh, all the tech behind all of these, uh, all these tastings. So give her a round of applause. Um, you know, like Natalie, next time you next time you want the recognition, you can just tell us. You yeah, know, yeah, we'd yeah, 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 yeah. like to think that wasn't over. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the fourteen, Dad. I, I I just think that this is absolutely such a classic uh, Rutherford Cabernet with that beautiful black fruit, green fruit combination just on the edge. The tension in this wine is what gives it that really unique, uh, dusty, earthy sort of character. And then just look at the flavors on this wine. It's so solid and yet not heavy in any way. It just flows off the tongue. This is the, the worst of the drought years in those early years. So we, so we were now third year in our third or fourth year into a severe drought. These vines were just putting their roots down deeper and deeper in the ground, and they were just bringing up more 
and more flavor and you're just getting it all in this wine. It's really a special. I've always loved the 14 for how open it's been. Um, you know, the, the 13 and the 15 are often, uh, you know, we, we often get questions about comparing vintages. You know, we, it, as we've said a few times, we talk about vintages more like personalities. Um, for me, 14 has always been this super friendly, super open kind of vintage. And I think you're getting that. I think it's, it's one of those vintages that just it reflected, it absorbed and reflected and reflects now in the glass all of that California sunshine, all of that joyousness that you get from the warm growing season. So do, we, so do we have any more cool photos? I want to, I want to keep the story of the grapevine going. Okay, let's what, do what, it. what else we got, Adam? Now that I know everyone knows who you are. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a vine right after it's been right after it started to bud out. So this is just a few days after after bud break is really you because you in on that a little bit. Yeah. So you can see, you know, the cover crop still hasn't been put into the soil, but the vines have made the decision. Hey, it's time to get rolling. Um, and so these are only a few inches long. They're just starting to grow out. Even some of the buds themselves are, are almost a little uneven. Some of them are not even out yet, or just starting to come on. Just starting there. to grow. Yeah. But you know, kind of the, the crazy thing about it. So this is what really starts the growing season. And the growing season is because uh, the fruit is going to be on these green shoots now. The new growth, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so it okay. takes a while for it's next now. That's so we'll. Great. You know, within a few, with even just in a few weeks of that coming out. Now we're turning into cover crop here, and you would you really get a full plowing. Yeah, exactly. So you're seeing the different stages right after these vines start to bud out. This is when we'll start doing our primary ground management. So the vines uh, on the left hand row that you see there, those have just been hoe plowed, and that's our primary way of removing Weeds. any cover crop uh, from between underneath the vine. So this is the way of not um, using you a little bit on the on the left hand side there to show that how that plow has swung in and out it's really i wish we had a, uh, a photo a video of that it was it's so cool yeah, yeah. so so the whole plow is basically it's a plow that swings in underneath the vines and scoops Just out see that scoop there yeah scoops out cool. the cover crop into the center of the row where it's much easier to manage and so the vine the vine row that we have in the center here has been disc once uh so we'll send a, a, a disc through to chop up the cover crop um, and start to incorporate yeah. it into the soil. You can see the vines on the right are still waiting for the whole plow. It's probably uh, right behind the photographer. <laughs> you, you, you almost got run over when you're taking this picture. I think I can jump out of the truck to take the photo before it got whole plowed. But this is kind of right in the middle of the process. The spring, the early spring is that we're busy as bees trying to get this ground cover managed before it starts to dry out because this is sort of the calculus every year is when is the rain going to stop and when do you know when do the vines going to need all of the resources of that resources of that soil to keep going um you know the timing of that cover crop management is, is extremely important and okay, um, we already seen that one so yeah Move through. There we go. Now. Within, within a few short weeks of after those vines have budded out, this is what you'll see. And this is about where the vines are right about now. Nope. This is this is just a couple of weeks ago. Oh, uh, is that right? Okay. So uh, yeah. yeah so guess. this is this is uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon. Excuse year. me. Blame me for two weeks being two weeks off. Yeah. Well, it, it you know it makes this, a lot of difference this at this time of year. <laughs> it really does make a difference at this time. Because these this is pre bloom. This this is pre bloom. At this stage in the game, these vines are growing on warm days. They'll grow up. Show bloom. Is that the next? They'll, they'll, they'll grow up to one to two inches per day and so you'll come back to a vine just a few days a few days later and you go well, wait a second you were just a little baby vine a, a, a few you know a few days ago what's going on here yeah. this is all uh now here's through. the little cluster and you can just see some of the flowers starting to come out right yeah exactly so you're looking at great flowers here this is a this is a, a cluster of i think actually riesling in bloom um, and so these are grape flowers. Grape flowers um, are interesting because they're very small. They're, they're not, you know, these big, they're not exactly roses, you know, that nobody's, <laughs> nobody's cutting these and putting them into their vase. Yeah, or, if I send those to Tori, she's not gonna Yeah, not gonna, not gonna work. Uh, but uh, grape flowers are very interesting because they're, they have evolved to be self-pollinating. Grape flowers are, are what are called perfect flowers that- uh, Are we getting into a more mature talk here that we need to- Yeah, th this, uh, the following section is 18 plus, by the way, uh, <laughs> where we have to talk about the birds and the bees a little bit. And the fact that grapevines don't actually depend upon pollinators to be able to no, fertilize they, their fruit. They are- uh, they, perfect, male, they call it perfect flower. Right? Perfect flowers are male and female parts. They self-fertilize. But what's really important during this time of year when bloom is happening is weather. And bloom is highly weather dependent. If you have 
weather that's very rainy and very cold, that can affect your bloom. For the most part, past frost at this point. So it's now now you're looking for uh, for cold or hot spells, anything that would stretch the vine while well, it's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, you can say that a lot. No, I can't. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> but so basically, you, we're looking for perfect weather during this time, and really, our danger at this time is a very uh, is a very bad hot spell that right. can push that can push the vines to send so much energy okay, that they'll right. actually blow their their. What do we got next now? Hey, what's good here? I don't know. This is good. Okay, now we're really getting into it, right? Now we're okay. getting into the growing season. You can see the canopies have started to close in on themselves. They've started to, they're growing leaves. They're growing leaves that are they're covering up a lot of those clusters. And this is where we're at in the game right now. This is probably actually, it's taken a couple of years ago. This is probably a week from now. These vines will have started to close in on each they're other. Starting to kiss. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can't say that. No, well, they're, 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 they're reaching around and saying hi to their neighbor. They're yeah. not actually socially distancing very well, in my opinion. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so this is okay. What's next, Matt? The 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 go. difference between these photos right here and the photos uh, of the vine just before it started to bud out is about a month and a half to two months. Okay. It's really not that much time in which the vines just tend to grow extremely quickly. Okay, so now this is suckering, right? So uh, so some of the shoots don't have fruit on them. We don't want them. They take away from the growth of the vine, so those get pulled off. And that's what you see here, all the green growth on the bottom. Where You see the guys uh, are actually taking what we call suckers off because we want to concentrate the growth into the canes or into the, the, the shoots that have the clusters on them. Uh, for the fruit. Yeah. yeah, so this is actually Cabernet Franc at the Leeds Vineyard um, that's, that's being suckered. Yeah. And once it's suckered and once we've actually leafed, uh, we'll go through and remove the leaves around the fruit. This is what you get. This is actually Merlot right after it's been leafed. This is a very impressive uh, set of fruit here. Yeah, that looks like a little too much. Uh, it's a little too much. So this, <laughs> this vine will have, this is pre being thinned. Uh, this will be thinned down quite a bit. But you know, this is where you get to by the by the time you're at midsummer. So by the time uh, the solstice rolls around, this is about where you're sitting uh, in the grapevines. And all of the time after this is really the the ripening phase of the grape. So this is where the berries have gotten to their full size, next, next, Natalie. and they'll have started to yeah, more uh, suckering. Yeah, they'll and start to eventually. Oh, wait, wait, wait. How come you got green and red berries on the same? Vine, so, so eventually, Dad, the vine has to make a decision okay. about when it is going to ripen fruit. Because yes. you know, we you can talk a little bit about thinking like a vine and, and how you know what we've talked this uh, about this in the context of when a grapevine decides to send its buds out, when it decides to when it decides to grow in the spring, it's deciding when to you know when to start its growing season. Eventually, it's got to make a decision about right. when to ripen. Just, just like humans that will develop another hormonal cycle saying, well, you know enough about growing because all of it's thought up to this point has been let's grow, let's grow, let's get more sun. But eventually it says, hmm, what about a little love life? You know, how, what do we, I need to produce fruit. Because remember that the, the, the vine is growing for the purposes of, of growth, but also to propagate itself through the spreading of its seed through the fruit. And then of course to return and be healthy for another year. So it actually completely changes its hormonal cycle to start to push for ripening. And it's a, uh, and that's what you see going on here. This again, I think it's Cabernet Sauvignon, but some of the berries are already receiving the hormones saying, let's turn our berry purple. And why does what, it- Why turn a berry purple? <laughs> well, think about it. Why does a grape even uh, produce color in its fruit? To make red wine? No, it's to attract birds. Remember now its process is going, I want to get this fruit ready. I want to get my seed hardened off so the seed can germinate, but then I need something to spread that seed. And that's going to be through birds and foxes and things like that. So that's why it makes its fruit tasty. Now it doesn't want its fruit to be tasty at this point because the seed isn't ready, right? It would be committing suicide. But at some point it says, my seed is hard enough, it's ready to go. And that's when all the sugar comes in and all the flavor and the color comes up. And it's the miracle of, of fruit. And that's that's balance in wine when the vine naturally gets to that point of saying, here, birdie, 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 that's when we want to pick because it up. Because this, this vine is making this decision based on a lot of different factors. It's going, well, you know, the sun's reached its solstice and it's starting to come back. So maybe that's an indication for me, but probably not the only indication. It, it's going to also going to say, well, how much water is left right. in, this, in the soil? It, it, and this is extremely critical for understanding 
the way that we make wine here at Broxley, which, you know, we, we often will you often hear us talk about lower alcohols in our wines, higher natural acidities, you know, and it's because we pick our, on a, but on a calendar basis, we pick our Cabernet Sauvignon a little bit earlier than most other producers in Napa Valley. But we don't pick our fruit before it's ripe. And I think that's, that's such a critical way, uh, way of understanding how we do things at Project and the whole purpose of dry farming, which is to get this perfectly ripe cluster. So this is a cluster of Cabernet at Rossi that's now fully ripe. And it gets to that point by all of these little micro decisions that the vine is making over the whole course of the year. How much, how much water is in the soil? How many nutrients do I have left? Where's the sun at? What's the temperature? Bro, you left me exactly seven minutes to go through the winemaking process. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> but I think it's, I, I think it's, excited about grape growing. I, I think it's worth doubling <laughs> down on this because it's, what, what else do we have, Natalie? <laughs> it, it's, it's so important for understanding what goes into grape cabernet is this, yeah. this notion of balance. We show that little of, video. So now I pick these grapes, or you pick these grapes, and you send them, and we uh, we have to rush through the winemaking process. We actually, why don't we have a whole other wine session on how we actually make the wine? Once You're just improvising on the spot. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, talk about your winemaking. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> so we got a cool video here of the destemmer. So this is a yeah. So this is us taking the uh, oh, this is slow motion, right? So we got to get this grapes away from the stems. The grapes are falling down below, but that's the uh, uh, the, the stems coming out and all the little leaves and stuff. We want to get rid of that because those berries, now those Cabernet Sauvignon berries, are going to go into a tank and ferment on the skins. Remember, that's how we make red wine. Uh, we can see actually see the berries uh, going down on the uh, of the conveyor. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, is this a little video as well, right? So in that machine, the the only the grapes. So oh, look, there's a little jack there. But we don't want that. This machine is actually designed to roll that forward. So you'll say, so only that fruit is going down. Those are going to get collected and put into a tank, and um, and it will start to ferment in, in, into wine. And uh, so here we go. Um, of course, this is harvest. Everything breaks down in the middle of harvest. Did you know that uh, grapes produce uh, heat when they ferment? So we have to cool them and we have to go lie in the shade if you're a dog. Uh, what, what's, how did Sari sneak into my wine? Uh, She's so cute. Oh, that's, <laughs> I can't believe it. We have almost wasted another good hour. Yeah, we, but it, we, we let me talk about wine making at all. Go, go on. Yeah, we'll, we'll, what, 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 in two minutes? Yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna run over time. We're going to do it. Oh, we are really. You've no, you had a whole week off. Uh, we got, we well, get to go on. The show must go on. The show must go on. So it's it's you know so obviously uh, the brilliance of the vineyard team has gotten these perfectly ripe grapes oh into the gosh. into the winery, and then it's then it's the winemaking winemaking team's turn to just screw it up. Just to screw it up. So that take us through winemaking just really briefly. And for those of you on Instagram, uh, we're about to run out of time there, but we will restart the feed. So just uh, follow you know check for the to the re-updated feed since it cuts us off. Well, hour. look, I'm, I'm going to give uh, Rory a little just uh, a room here because uh, I, quite honestly, if we get the grapes right and we have brought them to this perfect moment of ripeness and we've got this healthy fruit coming in, the winemaking process itself is very, very simple. We just simply got to get those stems out. We got to get the berries into a tank. We don't even have to add yeast. It will start to ferment on its own. Eventually, those grapes will be crushed open. The juice will start to come out. And unfortunately, the cap, the skin start to rise to the top and the juice is down below, but we need to get that juice up into the skin. So two, three times a day, the guys will take the, the juice and bring it up and put it over the skins as it's fermenting. This is called pumping over. And this is how we keep that juice in constant contact with the skins. Because if you took a great berry, even that Cabernet berry and squeezed it, the juice would be white. All the color are in the skins. And so we got to get that color out into the wine itself. And that's uh, during this fermentation process. So uh, the wine is in contact with the skins, fermenting, the alcohol is produced, plus the heat of fermentation will, will extract that color into the wine. Now we have a red wine. Unfortunately, we have a red wine full of grape skins. So we got to get that wine out of the skins. So the way we do that is we drain off the wine called the free run. The skins are in the tank. Some poor bastard's got to get into that tank and shovel it out. And then that goes back into the press to squeeze the last bit of wine out of the skins because we don't want to waste any of that good stuff that's in there. And then that is all accumulated. And now we're ready. The wine is wine at that point. Now it's ready for its two years of setting down and aging 
and really becoming marvelous. And so this is when it would go into the barrels. And, uh, and, and you know, we're talking about almost two years in the barrel to mature and, and get flavored up. Uh, we have a little bit of a problem because the wine evaporates out of those barrels. So we have to go constantly in and top them up. That's the problem. Uh, after the first year, we start to look at all these different lots of Cabernet and say, what's the one wine we're going to make? And that's the blend tasting. We're starting our Cabernet blend tastings next week. I'm really excited. Next week, we're going to start tasting uh, the and, and We will bring the cuvee together that becomes this wine. And then another year in the in the barrel uh, aging before it's ready ready for bottling. So I just did my part in three and a half minutes. Ever. It just shows you the relative importance. Oh my God. Right. Yeah, so so we'll, take, we'll take a brief pause here to allow, allow Instagram to restart. And that, I'm up. This 14 is too good. Yeah. It is really, really good. Yeah. Really, really good. Are it's you guys good. enjoying this wine as much as we are? Because this is real Rutherford Cabernet Sauvignon right here. This so, really you know, it, it's a. Uh, you know, it's got a little Cabernet Franc in it, I think, as well. It right? does, yeah. definitely. A little bit of Cabernet Franc, um, just Cab Cab Franc. I think that was a good time to. <laughs> we got a million questions oh, here. God, Holy moly. Right. <laughs> so, what causes the 2014 vintage to smell so strong? We have coffee and mocha. Oh, well, that is, uh, you know, you say coffee and mocha, I say rough for dust. I think it's the same thing. It really is this combination of aromatic compounds that are so unique to the place. And this is the personality of the wine. Isn't it amazing, though? How, how, I think you nailed it in terms of the description of those flavors. Yeah. yeah. Do we keep our own inventory of rootstock for future use? No, we uh, depend upon a nursery, Martinez Nurseries, to buy rootstock. And so every year we'll communicate with them the the, a year prior to us naturally needing the rootstock, we'll communicate with Martinez and say, hey, we're going to need X amount of St. George, we're going to need X amount of 110R, we're going to need X amount of over. No, that's not true of the budding wood, though, because we do, for the most part, the salt selection. Get in there. Okay, well, hurry up, dude. Come on, whose question is this, anyway? Uh, okay. uh, so the rootstock we will purchase every year. However, the budding wood, the, the little uh, uh, buds of Cabernet Sauvignon or Sauvignon Blanc, or Merlot or Cabernet Franc that you saw us grafting into the vines, that we do something very special with, that we do select from our existing vineyards. Um, and, it, and it really is just as simple as going out and selecting a mature, so a, uh, a, a cane that's not green, but is turned into hard wood. We'll go out there and cut lengths of it that are about uh, a foot and a half, two feet long. And those will have the different buds on it. These shoots uh, that vines send up every year, every uh, four or five inches, there will be another bud. Every single one of those buds is a potential vine. It's another growing point from which that uh, a new vine can grow. And so our budding team, Freddie, Luis, Jose Luis, the guys on our team who uh, have do the grafting, have, yeah. do, do the grafting and develop this skill. It's a highly specialized skill. We go out and select uh, the budding wood from our existing vineyard. So they'll go out and select the vines that are the healthiest, the vines that are, have the best growth characteristics. And that's what's called, the French call it massal selection. So it's very different than going to a nursery and just, you know, dialing up their, going on their webpage and saying, hey, I, I need X amount of Cabernet Sauvignon. Instead, it's us going out and replicating the best characteristics of our own vineyards and really refining that into, into newly planted blocks. That's something that is a, a bit of a lost art in California. It's uh, a little bit more common maybe in the old world, but it's, uh, you know, it's, easy to call up a nursery well, and just now they're even doing green starters. Don't get me started on this. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's uh this uh, okay. we have more questions here. Oh, we got a million questions. So oh, yeah, when did the rootstock process start? So this was actually discovered in France in the 1880s as a response to they were desperately looking for yeah, solutions they were because out. Yeah. you know it, it's uh it was really uh, a total a disaster for French for French vineyards and really vineyards all over the world once phylloxera uh, reached around to all the different vineyards in the world is it kills them. It does, the vineyards aren't left. And you, if you can read viticultural reports from California in the 18, late 1880s, once phylloxera really started to spread, and it, it reads like a slow moving tragedy where you have reports coming in from different parts of the state saying, hey, 5% of the vineyards are dead, 20% of the vineyards are dead, 80% of the vineyards are dead. Hey, this one guy's got a vineyard that hasn't died yet just in the course of four or five years. Yeah. It's really, it, it was a Well, we saw it here in the 80s. It was a remarkable. And that, that was a recurrence uh, based off of a, a, a misguided recommendation on rootstock that, uh, that certain uh, we crop advisors made in the, in the 1970s and 1980s in California. 
on a rootstock that ended up being susceptible to phylloxera um, that was selected for other characteristics, but unfortunately it wasn't really resistant to phylloxera and the vines uh, for the most part ended up dying. Um, it is really phylloxera damage is slow, is somewhat slow moving, but um, it, it will uh, ultimately condemn a vineyard for the most part. Um, you know, this technique was, was discovered by a French, uh, French viticulturalist, and he has statues in, Fra in France as the kind of savior of, of French vineyards uh, that had, in most French vineyards are now, are now planted, and most vineyards in the world are planted onto American rootstock because that's what's resistant to phylloxera. There are a few isolated vineyards, very rare vineyards around, uh, around the old world and around California that are still planted on their own roots. Uh, in France, it'll, you'll, they'll be called, uh, they'll be called uh, Franc de Pied, so uh, French feet, essentially. And so yeah. they're very rare vineyards and usually very expensive wines because they are so rare and because they're necessarily very old vineyards at that point. And there is an, an interesting question, how often do you need to re replant the vines and why do we decide to do that? Um, I'll speak just for our own part. There are lots of reasons to replant uh, vineyards, some more cynical than others. Uh, but for us, the reason to replant a vineyard is usually because uh, the vine, we can gain some sort of advantage in the long term from a change in the way that these vines are, are being established. It's, very, it's essentially never because we say, hey, well, we don't want Cabernet anymore. We don't want Sauvignon Blanc. We'll have planted the right, usually the right variety in the right place. The, the natural lifespan of the vine though is several decades, right? I mean, it's, it's not... I, I've made wine from vines that are 130 years old. Um, vines in the right place. I made wine 130 years ago. Uh, well, how was it back then? Oh, you know, uh, yeah. I was just a lad though. Uh, just, it's, uh, you know, vines can live for a very, very long time. There are, are vines out there, great vines that are three, 400 years old. Um, the useful productive life of a grape vine is usually within that first century. And, and I like to say that the way that we set up our vineyards, we are planning for our Cabernet Sauvignon vineyards to last 50 years plus. And we're well on our way with a lot of these vineyards. The, the 08, um, you saw the planting in 1989 of those vines uh, that went, some of the vines that went into that 08 Cabernet, those vines are still thriving. We were just working on them earlier this morning and they're still just, just killing. They're, they're, they're growing strong. They're absolutely healthy. Um, there's, you know, we have no plans for pulling them out. We have no plans for redeveloping them because they're still just some of our top quality grapes. And that comes from the kind of extended and, and persistent good care of those vines. And a lot of that is balance and, and restraint by not wanting to dump a bunch of fertilizer and dump a bunch of water on there. Too far. It's, it's a very analogous to our own health. And, and uh, uh, with that, Maria, I'm I think we should start uh, thinking about putting our, our ribbon on this, but I want to talk about what we're going to do next week yeah. and then two weeks after that. Uh, very exciting. So next week, we want to take a little twist. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we get a lot of questions about, and we've alluded several points to um, the, how we got our name and all that, but uh, we're just going to have a reminiscing week next week, kind of the story of Frog's Leap, a lot of pictures about over the years about building the wine, maybe a couple or three special guests. And uh, what we want you to do this week, because you know, uh, we're looking, uh, we have a few of our restaurant partners who are starting to open up again. Uh, we wanna support your local uh, wine uh, purveyors. So we're asking you not to order wine from us, or well, you can do that if you want, but we're asking you to go out to one of your local purveyors and find a bottle of Frog Sleep and thank them for carrying Frog Sleep. If you go to your favorite store or, or a takeout restaurant or whatever, and they don't have frog sleep, would you please give them a proper scolding uh, because uh, we want them to be carrying frog sleep. But see if you can find a bottle out there, support it. If you can't, get a bottle of one of our friend's wines. But we're just going and to just do print, a- print out a fake label. Yeah, we'll print out a fake label. We'll send you a fake label. Yeah. yeah. But we're just gonna uh, drink a couple of, uh, of fun wines ourselves here and reminisce about the, the, the first 40 years since our 40th. Uh, birthday uh, this year for Frog Sleep. And so we're going to reminisce a little bit about the early days and, uh, and the development of Frog Sleep. So that's going to be next week. Uh, we'll be off the week after that, but then um, on June 27th is going to be my birthday party. And so we're uh, planning some special things for that um, uh, and a few special guests. And we got, we're going to, I'm going down to the cellar to select some uh, fun wines to, for you guys to have for that week. So uh, we'll have that news out uh, to you in the next uh, uh, next few days and uh, 
Uh, it's actually not going to be my birthday. It's going to be a celebration of my uh, uh, one of my an anniversary celebration of one of my birthdays because I don't want to actually say the number. Okay. I'll say the number. No, you're not. If I can, well, if I can remember, yeah. He is not going to be in on that session. <laughs> uh, we need to close today, but uh, we talked about this and we don't know exactly what to say. Um, but I think um, obviously we are we're so glad you're with us today. Uh, but we're not obviously um, oblivious to all that's going on out there in, in the world. The 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 peaceful protests, the the reawakening. We hope in this country of of what it means to have civil rights. And we, we're we listening. We don't know exactly how we can participate as a winery, but we're listening and we want to be, we want to be part of that. And we hope you do too. I don't know what you would add to that, Rory. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, this past week for us, it's been, and, and for everybody in the country, it's been a, a week of introspection and we're doing just a lot of, sometimes it's, the best thing we can do is just actually listen. And I think that's what I, certainly I've spent the last, several days doing and uh, a ton of support for the peaceful protests and, and for people uh, protesting for uh, against the, the, the long history of racial inequality in this country. And uh, we're, we are 100% behind that. And we're figuring out the, our way of doing our own ways of doing better. And yeah. we hope everybody is, we're thanking, thanking everybody for joining us today and, and, and uh, just very uh, hopeful to, very hopeful about moving forward and, and uh, enjoying uh, you know, making a better country is, as, as, as uh, absolutely. And, 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 and we're with you all on, on that as well. Uh, it's been fun today. We're so glad to be back. We, we I really missed last weekend. We'll see you next week with a fun, uh, another session. Uh, enjoy these beautiful cabernets. I certainly have. And here's to next week, you guys. We'll see Cheers. you.